Now we have some breaking news related to the vaccine rollout. It's just coming in. Joe Hill joins us. Joe, we're getting word of an aged care death. Hello, I'm Bob Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. And with vaccine safety on everyone's minds, news that an 82-year-old Brisbane woman died only hours after getting her COVID vaccine was pounced on by the media last week, with 10 News breaking into its bulletin to find out more. But as Joe Hill explained, there were crucial doubts about its significance. It's unclear if the vaccine is related to the woman's death. We know at this stage that she does have underlying health issues, including a, a lung disease. Now, you'd think they are pretty important caveats, given some people's anxiety about getting the vaccine. And you'd want to emphasise them when posting the story to social media, since that's where so many Australians get their news. So, how well did 10 News do? Well, you be the judge. Elderly woman dies less than four hours after COVID jab. Yes, sound the alarm. And the headline on 10 Melbourne's Facebook post was no better. Elderly woman dies hours after COVID jab. But at least 10 did add this rider to both the tweet and its Facebook post. Currently, there is no indication that the incident is linked to the vaccine. And where did 10 reveal that vital information? In the final paragraph, which is why readers saw red, with some of the 1,000 plus comments saying... Totally irresponsible headline. This is reckless reporting. You clowns in the news should be more professional instead of feeding the tinfoil hat brigade. Hard to argue with that, especially since this was actually the Pfizer vaccine, where few, if any, deadly side effects have been proven. But Tim was not the only one scaremongering, with headlines suggesting that the vaccine killed the 82-year-old. There was similar treatment in the Canberra Times, the Daily Mail and news.com.au, who all turned it into a massive story. So was there any cause for such hue and cry relating to the Pfizer jab? Not at all as Health Minister Greg Hunt made clear next day. There is no evidence, no sign uh, or no uh, uh, hint of any causal link at this stage. Sadly, more than uh, 1,000 people pass in aged care every week. It is inevitable, as the head of the TGA has uh, noted, uh, that this will include people who have been recently vaccinated. Which brings us to the AstraZeneca vaccine and the rare side effect that can cause deadly blood clots, which led to the dramatic news last week that Australia's rollout of the vaccine is not recommended for those under 50. Nicely summed up in the Courier Mail as... Astra La Vista. Vaccine U-turn. Luckily, the media reporting here was better. And it needs to be, because there's no doubt the AstraZeneca vaccine will still save lives if people get it especially if they're at higher risk of getting COVID-19. As the ABC reported... Even in Australia, where COVID-19 has been incredibly well controlled, we have lost more than 900 people to the disease. If every adult in Australia got the AstraZeneca vaccine, tragically, about 25 people might die from blood clots caused by the vaccine, based on current evidence. And let's not forget, in the US, more than half a million people have died from COVID-19 and the benefits of preventing that sort of tragedy are huge and obvious. But now, to the latest outrage about your ABC, which was whipped up over Easter by the folks at You Know Where. And note the crazy strapline. You would think that today of all days would be the type of occasion when the so-called national broadcaster would simply tell the story of the majority of people of what they did today. No, instead, they showed polling about the existence of God. Yes, Sky's Paul Murray was frothing at the mouth about the ABC on Easter Sunday and Monday, and so were his guests on both those days. I think it's about time that we seriously considered about cutting the, the ties with the ABC, that they go private. Yep, whatever the ABC did, it must have been bad. And Paul Murray wasn't finished, while Richo was at the ready. Talk about a disconnect when on a holy day you put out a poll about whether people believe in the holy occasion or not. They wouldn't dare do it for Ramadan and nor should they. It's the ABC and what, what do you expect? I mean, they feel it's their duty to punish anyone who, who has a belief, especially if it's a Christian belief. Mm. And waiting to join the chorus down on his farm was an angry Barnaby Joyce. The ABC just goes with this vitriolic crap of the left. And Barnaby had plenty more to say, starting with a confession. I don't pretend to be a saint, right? And I don't pretend to believe 
in Scott Morrison either. But I find it offensive that someone says that I'm going to come down so hard on people who believe in God. And there was still more anger to follow. So what exactly had the ABC done? Well, on Easter Sunday, it had run this disgraceful story. We asked Australians if they believe in God or the supernatural. Here's what they said. Which actually found that some 58% of Australians either do or might believe in God, while 60% of Australians do or might believe in miracles, and 53% believe in angels, while almost 70% believe in souls. Now, that is hardly shaking the foundations of Christianity. It's more like boosting it. But the other key point was that this was not the ABC's idea or its research, because, as the story revealed... The survey of a 1,000 people carried out by McCrindle Research for the Centre for Public Christianity... That's right. It was commissioned by a Christian advocacy group, whose mission statement on its website is... Promoting the public understanding of the Christian faith. And where you can read the study for yourself. Belief in Jesus rising from the dead, not dead yet. Yes, that's the one the ABC reported on. So, did the ABC skew the results? Well, no, because Natasha Moore, who wrote it up for the ABC, is a research fellow at the Centre for Public Christianity, as the article makes clear. Whoops, seems the folks at Sky didn't read that far. And nor did ex-ABC board member Michael Kroger, who in a competitive field made himself the biggest fool of all with rants like this. This despicable sort of contribution today, as you say, um, you, you know, just imagine if, you know, do you believe in Muhammad? Um, there, there was, there was um, you know, do, 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 you, do you believe that um, the infidels should be, should be crucified and murdered, uh, the non-believers? Um, you know, do you believe that? We're you know, running that through Ramadan. Um, yeah, it, it wouldn't happen. And, just, and this, just, this is just part of this sort of, you know, group think that uh, we can have open season on any form of Christianity and believers at all. Shocking I'm, stuff. I'm with you. All right, Particularly let's go. today, mate. Today. Oh. Shocking stuff, indeed. But no doubt Michael Kroger, Paul Murray, Pauline Hanson, Graham Richardson and Barnaby Joyce will all apologise for their stupid mistake this week. But now, let's go to yet another round in the fight between former PMs and News Corp. The former Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull, claims the state government has been bullied into sacking him from a job he was given only days ago. Mr Turnbull has been dumped as the head of the new Clean Energy Advisory Board. He claims he's the victim of a right-wing media campaign. And Malcolm Turnbull has indeed been busy making that claim. To the Nine Papers, the ABC and 10 News First, to name just a few. You know as well as I do, the, the reason the government uh, revoked my appointment was because of bullying from News Corp, and in particular the Daily Telegraph. It was designed to bully the government into doing what the owners of the Telegraph wanted, and the government has done just that. So, is Turnbull right to blame News Corp for his sacking? Well, up to a point, he was. As you can see from a series of telly front pages, starting on 2nd of April with this news splash. Libs are malcontent. Party revolts over Turnbull green job. And inside the paper, the telly had Turnbull as a miserable ghost in the coming Upper Hunter by-election. Completing its coverage with an editorial declaring it was a terrible time to hire Turnbull. Four days later, the telly was on his case again with another Turnbull front page. Malcolm's Coal War. XPM's NIMBY activism against mine. The story this time that the former PM owns a property in the Upper Hunter and had written to the state government last month objecting to a nearby coal mine development. And this meant, according to a second tele editorial headed Not the Right Job for a NIMBY, that... Mr Turnbull's personally stated views and vested interests seriously call into question his suitability to remain as chair of the New South Wales Net Zero Emissions and Clean Economy Board. So it's pretty clear that the telly was trying to get rid of him from his new climate change gig. But it was actually Nine-Owned 2GB that won the Kill Mal competition, starting with this reaction to his appointment as Clean Energy star from Ray Hadley's fill-in presenter, Mark Levy. That's right, Malcolm Turnbull. The former Prime Minister who is so bitter and twisted about his removal that he spent the following two and a half years doing everything in his now non-existent power to discredit the government. Ray Hadley then took up the baton with a clear and direct message to the New South Wales government. I mean, it's just absolutely incredibly stupid 
And I know that you didn't know there was a by-election when you made the appointment, Gladys Berejiklian, but now you do know. And how you can continue to support it I, is beyond me. It's just absolutely beyond me. Elsewhere on 2GB, fill-in drive host Clinton Maynard was also in on the act, having callers on to attack his guest, Matt Keane, the minister responsible for Turnbull's appointment. The bloke is a backstabber, and I will never vote up here in the Hunter Valley to you as long as he works in your com in your in your um, in your uh, your government. You, you and, made... I, and I know a lot of people up here, mate. I know a lot of people up here, and we all feel the same about Malcolm Turnbull. He's a backstabber, and he's not a nice person. And the campaign extended beyond the airwaves, with Hadley badgering New South Wales Deputy Premier John Barillaro and lobbying behind the scenes, telling 4BC's Neil Breen... Turnbull yesterday came out and said, we've got to stop mining coal in the Hunter Valley. That, that was the second day after being appointed on Tuesday. Yeah. So I sent John Barillaro a text about an hour ago. I told you he's a complete imbecile, and so is Keane. They're making you look like one as well. I just got a thumbs up from him. And amazingly, five days later, when Turnbull was unceremoniously sacked, it was announced live on Hadley's show by Barillaro himself. I wish I spoke up, spoken up. I got it wrong. But I can give you uh, a story right now, breaking for you, Ray, is that this morning, just now, Matt Keane has agreed uh, that he won't proceed with the appointment of Malcolm Turnbull as chair. He's rescinding that appointment and that statement is going out as we finish the show. Well, common sense has finally prevailed. Common sense has prevailed. And well done to Matt Keane. Well done to you. There's no more to say. So, did the New South Wales government in fact bow down to the media's demands? The minister responsible, Matt Keane, says no, telling Chris Kenny. I made the decision to withdraw or to rescind the nomination. I didn't do that because Uke's Corp uh, dictated terms to me, that's for sure. Well, maybe he didn't. There was fierce opposition to Turnbull's appointment within the New South Wales Coalition government, and Malcolm made things worse with his ill-timed comments about halting new coal mines. But it's clear the telly and 2GB went after him, and the New South Wales government does have a record of buckling to that sort of media pressure. And it allowed Turnbull to join Kevin Rudd in making comments like this one today to the Senate's media diversity inquiry. The saddest thing about of it all was the way Matt Keane, the minister, a good good man, you know, very committed to taking action, had to then go to the Daily Telegraph and be quoted in it saying, oh, News Corp had nothing to do with this decision. <laughs> this is like somebody, this is like somebody who's taken down to the police station, beaten over the head until they finally sign a fake confession, the last line of which says, I confirm that I did so of my own free will. I think it is a, a, we face a real threat to our democracy. We asked News Corp if they wanted to comment on Mr Turnbull's claim. They did not respond. And finally, let's go to Africa, which rarely gets on commercial TV news unless hundreds of thousands of people, or a few elephants, are dying. And some dramatic footage last week that Seven and Ten could not resist. A fighter jet being shot out of the sky over Nigeria. The moment it exploded mid-air was caught on camera. Jihadist group Boko Haram has claimed the strike, releasing video from the wreckage site. Boko Haram has killed tens of thousands of people in a 10-year insurgency. They say if it bleeds, it leads, and if it explodes as well, so much the better. So it's no great surprise that that tragic incident made it into Seven's bulletin, or that 10 News jumped on the story too. The Islamic State-linked group Boko Haram says it shot down this Nigerian fighter jet over the country's northeast. It released a video of the attack days after Nigeria's Air Force reported the plane missing. Now, a jet did go missing on the 31st of March, and it seems it crashed. But two days before 7 and 10 ran their stories, the Nigerian Air Force had issued a statement to say the explosion footage was faked. Although the video was still being thoroughly analysed, it is evident that most parts of the video were deliberately doctored to give the false impression that the aircraft was shot down. And why were they so certain? Because, they said... It is almost impossible for an aircraft to have exploded mid-air in the manner depicted in the video and still have a good part of its fuselage, including its tail, intact. Indeed, an explosive impact of that nature would have scattered the debris of the aircraft across several miles. And the day before the 10 and 7 stories went to air, ABC Radio carried a report from the BBC's John Shea, which noted that warning. 
The Nigerian Air Force has dismissed as fake a video released by Islamist, Islamist militants claiming they'd shot down a fighter jet. Meanwhile, CNN had thoroughly debunked the video online. Military analysts said Boko Haram is not known to possess the sort of weapons that could shoot down a fast-flying jet at altitude, such as ground-to-air missiles. And as CNN pointed out, clues to the fakery could also be found in the footage itself, which showed uncanny similarities to an incident in Syria nine years ago. The smoke trail and the shape and colour of the fireball are identical to a mid-air explosion of a helicopter over the Syrian city of Marat al-Numan near Idlib in 2012. And sure enough, if you take the footage of that incident from 2012 and compare it to the shape of the fireball in the Boko Haram video, they are identical. Amazing, eh? So two major TV networks in Australia who rarely cover Nigeria have published fake terrorist propaganda after it's been widely exposed as a fake. Not good. We asked both 10 and 7 if they checked what was already reported about the video before publishing, particularly as there were big questions already out there about its authenticity. 10 told us it was reporting on a claim, not a fact, and that it relied on trusted international news agency partners. We did not hear back from 7. Seems when it comes to covering news in Africa, neither care that much about accuracy. That's all from us tonight. There's more on our website where you can stream or download the programme and read a statement from Channel 10. And don't forget, Media Bytes every Thursday online. But for now, until next week, goodbye.